Chapter 2 The Nitya Dharma of the Jiva is pure and everlasting. The next morning, Sanyasi Thakur found no opportunity to inquire from Premdas Babaji, who was internally immersed in Brajabhav, mellows of service in the mood of the residence of Braja. At midday, after accepting alms from the houses of the villagers, they sat together in the arbor known as Sri Madhavi Malati Mandap. Paramahamsa Babaji Mahashai then began to speak compassionately. O best of sadhus, what conclusions have you reached after yesterday's discussion on the subject of Dharma? Feeling supreme bliss, Paramananda, Sanyasi Thakur asked, Prabhu, if the jiva is infinitesimal, how can his eternal Dharma be full and pure? And if the natural function of the jiva is formed at the time he is constituted, how can that function be eternal? When Paramahamsa Babaji heard these two questions, he meditated on the lotus feet of Sri Sachinandan, and then smiling said, Respected sir, although the jiva is infinitesimal, his dharma is full and nitya, eternal. Minuteness is only a trait by which he is identified. Parabrahma Sri Krishna Chandra is the one and only infinite substance, Brihadvastu, and the jivas are his innumerable atomic particles. Like sparks emanating from an undivided fire, the jivas emanate from Krishna, who is the embodiment of immutable consciousness. Just as every spark is endowed with the potency of the complete fire, so each and every jiva is capable of displaying the full function of consciousness. If a single spark has enough fuel, it can kindle a blazing fire that will incinerate the whole world. Similarly, even a single jiva can inundate the entire world with love if he attains Sri Krishna Chandra, who is the real object of love. However, the infinitesimal conscious jiva cannot exhibit the natural development of his spiritual function as long as he fails to contact the real object of that function. In reality, it is only when the jiva is in connection with his object that the identity of its dharma becomes apparent. What is the nitya dharma, or eternal constitutional function of the jiva? You must examine this question carefully. Transcendental love for Krishna, Prem, is the jiva's nitya dharma. The constitutional nature of the jiva is consciousness, which is transcendental to mundane matter. His eternal function is divine love, and the nature of that pure Prem is service to Krishna. Therefore the constitutional function of the jiva is service to Krishna, which is the nature of Prem. The jiva has two conditions, the pure, liberated state and the conditioned state. In the liberated state, the jiva is completely spiritual, chinmaya, and has no connection with mundane matter. However, even in that pure condition, he is still an infinitesimal entity. The jiva can undergo a change in condition because he has the quality of minuteness. Krishna, however, never undergoes a change of condition, for by his very nature he is the entity of infinite cognition. By his essential constitution as a vastu, a factual existent entity, he is supreme, completely pure and eternal, whereas the jiva, by his essential constitution as a vastu, is minute, apart, liable to contamination and subject to repeated change. The unadulterated spiritual function, dharma, of the jiva is also great, undivided, pure and everlasting, but he may become atomic, incomplete and impure. As long as the jiva is pure, his dharma displays its spotless character. However, when he is contaminated by involvement with maya, his true nature is perverted and he becomes impure, bereft of shelter, and oppressed by mundane happiness and distress. The jiva's course of material existence
comes into effect as soon as he forgets his attitude of service to Krishna. As long as the jiva remains pure, he maintains his identity and self-conception in accordance with his unadulterated spiritual function, swadharma. His innate and original egoism is therefore rooted in the conception that he is a servant of Krishna. However, that pure egoism recedes and assumes many different forms as soon as he is contaminated by association with maya. The gross and subtle bodies then cover his pure constitutional identity, and as a result, a different egoism emerges in the subtle body, lingasarir. When this combines with the soul's identification with the gross body, stulasarir, a third form of egoism is assumed. In his pure spiritual form, the jiva is exclusively a servant of Krishna. When the jiva identifies with the subtle body, his original pure egoism of being a servant of Krishna is covered, and he thinks that he can enjoy the fruits of his actions. He then obtains a gross body and thinks, I am a brahmana, I am a king, I am poor, I am miserable, I am overwhelmed by disease and lamentation, I am a woman, I am the master of this person and that person. Thus he identifies himself with many different types of gross bodily conceptions. When the jiva associates with these different types of false egoism, his constitutional function becomes perverted. The intrinsic constitutional function, svadharma, of the jiva is unalloyed prem. This prem manifests in a perverted way in the subtle body in the form of happiness and distress, attachment and aversion, and so on. This perversion is observed in a more concentrated form in the gross body as the pleasures of eating, drinking, and contact with sense objects. You should understand clearly that the eternal function of the jiva, nitya dharma, is manifest only in his pure state. The dharma that arises in the conditioned state is known as circumstantial, naimitika. Nitya dharma is by nature complete, pure and eternal. I will explain circumstantial dharma, naimitika dharma, at length another day. The unalloyed Vaishnava dharma that has been depicted in the Srimad Bhagavatam is eternal religion, nitya dharma. The various types of dharma that are propagated in the world may be divided into three categories, nitya dharma, naimitika dharma, circumstantial dharma, and anitya dharma, impermanent religion. Anitya dharma is religion that does not speak about the existence of Ishwara and does not accept the eternality of the soul. Naimitika dharma acknowledges the existence of Ishwara and the eternality of the soul, but only endeavors to obtain the mercy of Ishwara through provisional methods. Nitya Dharma strives to obtain the service of Bhagavan by means of unalloyed prem. Nitya Dharma may be known by different names according to differences of country, race and language. However, it is one and supremely beneficial. The ideal example of Nitya Dharma is Vaishnava Dharma, which is prevalent in India. The pristine state of Vaishnava Dharma is that Dharma which Bhagavan Sachinandan, the Lord of our heart, has taught to the world. It is for this reason that great personalities, absorbed in the bliss of divine love, have accepted these teachings and taken help from them. At this point, Sanyasi Thakur with folded hands said, Prabhu, I am constantly witnessing the super-excellence of the spotless Vaishnava Dharma, which Sri Sachinandan has revealed, and I have clearly realized the contemptible nature of Sankaracharya's monistic doctrine. Still, something has come to my mind, which I feel I must submit to you. I don't want to hide it. I understand that Mahabhav, which was displayed by Sri Chaitanya, is the highest state of concentrated prem. Is it different from the attainment of the perfection of absolute oneness, Advaita Siddhi? When Paramahamsa Babaji 
heard the name of Sri Sankaracharya, he offered prostrated obeisances unto the Acharya and said, Respected Sir, Sankara Shankara Sakshad, Sankaracharya is none other than Mahadev Sankara or Shivji. You should always remember this. Sankara is guru for the Vaishnavas, and for this reason Mahaprabhu has referred to him as Acharya, spiritual preceptor. For his own part, Sri Sankara was a perfect Vaishnava. At the time of Sri Sankara's appearance in India, there was a great need for a Guna avatar, an incarnation who presides over the qualities of material nature, like him. The study of the Vedic Shastras and the practice of Varnashram Dharma had become practically extinct in India due to the influence of Shunyavad, Voidism, the nihilistic Buddhist philosophy. Sunyavad is vehemently opposed to the personal conception of Bhagavan. Although it partially accepts the principle of the living being's identity as a conscious spiritual soul, Jivatma, it is an extreme example of Anitya Dharma, impermanent religion. The Brahmanas of that era had abandoned the Vedic Dharma and had in effect all become Buddhists. At that point, Sankaracharya appeared as an extremely powerful incarnation of Mahadev. He re-established the credibility of the Vedic literatures and converted the Shunyavad doctrine of voidism into the Brahmavad doctrine of Nirvishesh, featureless Brahman. This was an extraordinary feat and India will remain ever indebted to Sri Sankaracharya for this tremendous contribution. All activities in this world fall into one of two categories. Some are relative to a particular period of time and some are applicable for all time. The work of Sankaracharya was relative to a particular period and bestowed tremendous benefit. Sankaracharya lay the foundation upon which great Acharyas such as Sri Ramanuja Acharya erected the edifice of pure Vaishnava Dharma. Consequently, Sankaravata was a great friend and preceptor who pioneered Vaishnava Dharma. Vaishnavas are now reaping the fruit of Sankaracharya's philosophical precepts. Jivas who are bound by matter are in great need of understanding their entanglement in material nature and their relationship with Bhagavan, Sambandha Gyan. Sankaracharya and the Vaishnavas both accept that the sentient living entities in this material world are completely distinct and separate from their gross and subtle material bodies, that the jivas are spiritually existent, and that liberation, mukti, entails giving up all connection with this material world. Consequently, there is a great deal of agreement between the doctrine of Sankara and that of the Vaishnavacharyas, up to the point of liberation. Sankara has even taught that the worship of Sri Hari is the method by which one can purify the heart and attain liberation. He has only remained silent regarding what extraordinary destination the jiva attains after liberation. Sankara knew perfectly well that if the jivas could be prompted to strive for liberation through the worship of Hari, they would gradually become attached to the pleasure of bhajan and thus become pure devotees, shuddha bhaktas. That is why he simply pointed out the path and didn't reveal further confidential secrets of Vaishnava Dharma. Those who have scrutinized the commentaries of Sankara can understand his inner intention, but those who are only preoccupied with the external aspect of his teachings remain far from the threshold of Vaishnava Dharma. From one specific point of view, the perfected state of absolute oneness, Advaita Siddhi, seems identical to Prem. However, the narrow interpretation of absolute oneness is certainly different from the meaning of Prem. What is Prem? You should understand clearly that Prem is the unadulterated function by which two transcendental entities are spontaneously attracted to each other. Prem cannot occur without the separate existence of two transcendental entities. Krishna Prem is the Dharma by which all transcendental entities are eternally attracted 
to the supreme transcendent entity, Sri Krishna Chandra. The ideology of Prem rests on the eternally established truths that Krishna Chandra has his own eternal separate existence and that the jivas have their own eternal separate existence, following his leadership, Anugatya, and that this Prem Tattva is also an eternally perfect truth, Nitya Siddha Tattva. When we talk about the process of enjoyment, three separate ingredients are distinctly present in their own right. They are the relisher of Prem, the object who is to be relished through Prem, and the process of relishing Prem, or the lover, the beloved, and love itself. These three moods are always distinct, pratak, from each other. This is an accepted fact. Prem cannot be an eternal reality if the one who delights in Prem is one and the same as the object of Prem. We can say that absolute oneness, Advaita Siddhi, is the same as Prem if we define Advaita Siddhi as the pure state of a transcendental entity who has no relationship with insentient matter. This conception of Advaita Siddhi implies oneness in the sense that spiritual entities have become one in their spiritual nature and function, Chid Dharma. However, modern scholars who have adopted the doctrine of Sankra are not satisfied with this idea, and they have tried to establish that spiritual entities, Chid Vastu, have themselves become indistinguishably one and the same substance. In so doing, they have disregarded the true Vedic conception of non-distinction and have propagated a distorted version in its place. Vaishnavas declare this philosophy to be opposed to the Vedas because it denies the eternality of Prem. Sankaracharya described the state of non-distinction simply as the unadulterated condition of spiritual substance. However, his modern-day followers could not understand his inner intention and consequently they have marred their guru's reputation by teaching a thoroughly debased doctrine known as Mayavad, which describes the various states of Prem as illusory phenomena. Mayavadis deny from the very outset that anything exists except the one spiritual substance, Brahman, and they also deny that the function of Prem exists within that spiritual substance. They say that Brahman is beyond the influence of Maya as long as it remains in a state of oneness. But that Brahman becomes overwhelmed by Maya when it becomes embodied and takes on various shapes in the form of jivas. Consequently, they believe that the form of Bhagavan is an illusory manifestation. In reality, though, his form is eternally pure and constituted of concentrated consciousness. For this reason, they have concluded that Prem and its various manifestations are illusory and that the knowledge of non-duality, Advaita Gyan, is beyond the influence of Maya. Their mistaken conception of oneness, Advaita Siddhi, can never be equated with Prem. Sri Chaitanya Dev instructed the world to taste Prem and he personally taught it by his transcendental behavior and activities. This Prem is completely beyond the jurisdiction of Maya and it is the highest development of the unalloyed state of perfect oneness, Advaita Siddhi. The state known as Mahabhav is a special transformation of this Prem in which Premananda is extraordinarily powerful. Consequently, both the separateness and intimate relationship of the lover and the beloved are transported to an unprecedented state. The inconsequential theory of Mayavad is useless for understanding the subject matter of Prem in any of its stages. Sanyasi Thakur said with great reverence, O Prabhu, my heart is deeply pierced with the realization that the Mayavad doctrine is most insignificant. Today you have mercifully dispelled whatever lingering doubts I had in this regard. I feel a strong desire to give up wearing this Mayavad sannyas garb. Babaji Mahashai said, O Mahatma, 
I never give instruction on external dress. When the dharma, spiritual function, of the heart becomes purified, the external dress will be set right easily and naturally. Where there is too much concern for external appearance, there is inattention to the soul's inner function. When your heart becomes pure, you will automatically develop attachment for the external behavior of Vaishnavas, and there will be no fault if you change your external dress then. Absorb your heart completely in trying to follow the teachings of Sri Krishna Chaitanya, and later you may adopt the external items of Vaishnava Dharma, to which you are naturally inclined. You should always remember this instruction of Sriman Mahaprabhu. Markata Vairagya na karo, loka dekana, yata yogya vishai bunja, ana saktahan, antare nishta karavaye, loka vyavahar, achirat krishna tomai, karibe udar. Chaitani Charitamrita, Madhya Lila, 16, 238-239 do not adopt Markata Vairagya, external monkey renunciation, simply to impress the general populace. You should accept without attachment whatever sense objects are appropriate for maintaining your devotional practices and give up all material desires within your heart. Internally develop staunch faith in Sri Krishna and externally carry out your worldly responsibilities in such a way that no one can detect your inner mood. If you act like this, Sri Krishna will very quickly deliver you from material existence. Sanyasi Thakur understood the deep significance of this discussion and made no further suggestion about changing his outer dress. Folding his hands, he said, Prabhu, since I am now your disciple and I have taken shelter at your lotus feet, I will bear upon my head whatever instructions you give without any argument. I have understood from your instructions that unadulterated Krishna Prem constitutes the only Vaishnava Dharma. This love for Krishna is the Nitya Dharma of the Jivas, and it is complete, pure, and natural. But what of the various Dharmas that are prevalent in different countries? How should I regard these different religions? Babaji Mahashai said, O Mahatma, Dharma is only one not two or many. The jivas have only one dharma, and it is known as Vaishnava dharma. Differences of language, country or race cannot create differences in dharma. Jiva dharma is the constitutional function of the jiva. People may give it different names, but they cannot create a different constitutional function. Jiva dharma is the unadulterated spiritual love that the infinitesimal entity has for the infinite entity. It appears to become distorted into various mundane forms because the jivas possess different material natures. That is why the name Vaishnava Dharma has been given to identify the pure form of Jiva Dharma. The degree of Vaishnava Dharma in any religion or Dharma is a measure of its purity. Some time ago, in Sri Braja Dham, I submitted a question at the lotus feet of Sriman Mahaprabhu's confidential associate, Sri Sanatan Goswami. I asked him whether the word ishk in the Islamic religious tradition means unadulterated love or something else. Sanatan Goswami was a learned scholar in all the Shastras, and his erudition in the Arabic and Farsi languages in particular knew no bounds. Sri Rupa Goswami Sri Jiva Goswami and other exalted spiritual preceptors were present in that assembly. Sri Sanatan Goswami kindly answered my question as follows. Yes, the word ishk means love. Adherents of Islam do use the word ishk in relation to the worship of Ishwara, but the word generally means love in the ordinary worldly sense. Islamic religious teachers have not been able to understand the true conception of the pure spiritual entity, or Shuddha Chit Vastu. This is evident from the poetic account of the devoted lovers, Laila and Majnun, and from the literary descriptions of Ishk by the great poet Hafiz. 
they have referred to ishq either as physical love pertaining to the gross body or as emotional love in relation to the subtle body. Thus they cannot have had any experience of unadulterated divine love, prem, towards Bhagavan. I have never seen this type of prem described in any religious texts of the Muslim teachers. I have only seen it in the Vaishnava Shastras. The same is true of the Muslim word ru, which means soul or spirit. It does not seem that Muslim teachers have used the word ru to mean the Shuddha Jiva, the liberated soul. Rather, they have used the word ru in the sense of the Bada Jiva, the soul bound by matter. I have not seen unadulterated love for Krishna taught in any other religion, whereas descriptions of Krishna Prem are common throughout the teachings of Vaishnava Dharma. For example, Srimad Bhagavatam 1.1.2 describes Krishna Prem very clearly in the statement Projita Kaitava Dharma, the highest truth from which all deceitful religiosity has been rejected. Nonetheless, I have full faith that Sri Krishna Chaitanya was the first to give full instructions on the religion of unalloyed Krishna Prem. If you have faith in my words, you may accept this conclusion. Having heard these instructions, I offered prostrated obeisances to Sanatana Goswami again and again. When Sanyasi Thakur heard this explanation from Babaji Maharaj, he immediately offered Dandavat Pranam to him. Paramahamsa Babaji then said, O best of the Vaishnavas, I will now answer your second question. Please listen attentively. We use the words creation and formation in connection with the jiva, but this is in a material context. The time that we experience is divided into three phases of past, present and future. This is material time, jadiya kala, which is connected with the material energy, maya. In the spiritual domain, there is spiritual time, chit kala, which eternally exists in the present, with no divisions of past and future. The jivas and Krishna exist in that spiritual time, so the jiva is eternal and ever-existing. The functions of creation, formation and falling take place under the influence of material time, and they are used to describe the jiva after he is bound in this material world. However, even though the jiva is infinitesimal, he is an eternal spiritual entity, and his fundamental constitution existed before he entered this material world. Since past and future do not exist in the spiritual world, whatever occurs within that spiritual time frame is eternally present. Therefore, in reality, the jiva and his constitutional function are both ever-present and eternal. I have explained all this to you in words, but you can only understand their true meaning to the extent that you have realized and experienced the unalloyed spiritual realm. I have just given you a glimpse. You should try to realize the meaning of what I have said through spiritual meditation, Chit Samadhi. You will not be able to understand these topics through mundane logic or by debate. The more you can free your faculty of experience from material bondage, the more you will be able to experience the spiritual domain. First you should cultivate the realization of your Shuddha Swarup, pure spiritual identity, and practice chanting Shri Krishna Nam purely. Then your spiritual function, Jaiva Dharma, will be clearly revealed. Spiritual realization and experience cannot be fully purified by the eightfold yoga system, Astanga Yoga, or by cultivating knowledge of the all-pervading, featureless Brahman, Brahma Gyan. The jiva can only manifest his eternal spiritual function, Nitya Siddha Dharma, by constantly cultivating activities directly meant for Krishna's pleasure. You should constantly practice chanting Hari Nam with great enthusiasm. Such practice is true spiritual culture. By chanting Hari Nam regularly, you will develop unprecedented attachment for Sri Krishna Nam within a short time 
and you will directly experience the spiritual realm. Chanting Sri Hari Nam is the foremost of all the different limbs of bhakti, and it yields the quickest results. This is confirmed by Sri Mahaprabhu's instructions in Sri Krishna Das Kaviraj's magnificent work, Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita. Bhajanera Madhya Shreshta Nava Vida Bhakti Krishna Prema Krishna Dite Dare Mahashakti Tara Madhye Sarava Shreshta Nama Sankirtan Niraparade Nama Laile Paya Prema Dan Anchilila 4.70-71 Of all the different types of spiritual practice, the nine forms of bhakti, shravanam, kirtanam, etc., are the best because they have tremendous power to deliver Krishna and Krishna Prem. Of these nine practices, Nam Sankirtan is the best. By chanting Sri Krishna Nam without offense, one obtains the priceless treasure of Prem. Mahatma, if you ask how to recognize a Vaishnava, I will tell you that a Vaishnava is someone who has given up all offenses and who chants Sri Krishna Nam with great feeling. There are three categories of Vaishnavas, the Kanishta, neophyte, the Madhyam, intermediate, and the Uttam, most exalted. A Kanishta Vaishnava chants the name of Krishna occasionally. A Madhyam Vaishnava chants the name of Krishna constantly, and an Uttam Vaishnava causes others to chant Sri Nam by his very presence. According to Mahaprabhu's instructions, we do not need any other criteria to discern who is a Vaishnava. Sanyasi Thakur was deeply immersed in the nectar of Babaji Maharaj's instructions, and he began to dance as he chanted Sri Krishna Nam. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. On that day, he experienced taste, ruchi, for Hari Nam. Offering prostrated obeisances unto the lotus feet of his guru, he prayed, Prabhu, O friend of the destitute, please bestow your mercy upon this wretched soul. Thus ends the second chapter of Jaiva Dharma, entitled, The Nitya Dharma of the Jiva is Pure and Everlasting. <laughs>